we're going to get started with our lesson today, which is again the final one in the series of how the wise woman builds a strong home. Uh, this is based on Proverbs 14.1, which simply says the wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands the foolish one tears hers down. And we don't want to be the foolish one, do we? So we're going to look at the last piece of the home. God has given us these analogies for the pieces of the home. We've looked at, you know, the, the electrical system and the foundation and the floors and the framing and the roof and the trusses and all these things. And God's given us analogies for those pieces. Well, today we're on to the family room. The family room. What could that represent? And in praying about this, I felt like God said, that's the place where there should be joy and fun and laughter. And we, as wives and moms, we can set the atmosphere in that regard, can we not? Because, you know, you know that expression, if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? Isn't that so true? So if we have this joy kind of bubbling forth, everyone in the, in the household is going to be more likely to be joyful themselves. If we're playful and we laugh easily, everyone else in the household will probably be more likely to laugh easily also. We kind of set the tone. So today, we're going to figure out how to bring that joy into our own lives so that it permeates the atmospheres of our home. Wouldn't we all want that? I think so. And there's something so attractive about joy in a relationship, right? Your husband, your friends, your children, everyone is going to want to be with you if you have this, this inner sense of joy, if you have that sparkle in your eye, if you're kind of playful and you laugh easily and you have a sense of humor and you just exude that joy, people want to be around you. Your family wants to be around you. Your husband wants to be around you. It's kind of a, a super attractive quality. I also feel like God is saying to us, especially if you're married, you're you know, you want your husband to be a stronger follower of Jesus, right? But if you're always angry and depressed and critical and complaining and always looking at the glasses being half empty instead of half full, how does that exactly inspire your husband to want to follow this Jesus that you say you're following, right? So maybe we should rethink our own attitudes first. I mean, how do we grab hold of this joy so that our husbands and our children want what we have, this relationship with Jesus? Proverbs 17, 22, interesting little proverb. It says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Ooh, something to ponder, right? Maybe your home seems like kind of like dried up bones, right? Mm. Also, joy and laughter in your relationships, it helps your relationships stay resilient. Joy and laughter help your relationships stay resilient. When you have a sense of humor and you don't every, you know, take everything so seriously, and when you have that inner joy, you're more able to look over those minor offenses and the other person's imperfections instead of growing resentful and carrying around this feeling of hopelessness, right? If you're able to just kind of have that sense of humor and, and just be able to overlook those minor offenses, right? So this actually, this joy and laughter is going to help your relationships be more resilient. Proverbs 16, 24, listen to what it says. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 19, 11, a person's wisdom yields patience it is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Boy, we could ponder that one for a long time, couldn't we? It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. We tend to not do that. We tend to focus on the offense and get bitter and angry and our claws come out. What if we were to practice just that one proverb, Proverbs 19:11? It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. So when your husband disappoints you on a fairly minor level. We're not talking about that he you know, just did something horrendous, but you know, when he disappoints you on a fairly minor level, when you're bothered by his imperfections, can you have a sense of humor? Can you be even playful in that moment? Maybe even promote healing laughter in that moment? Or do you instead criticize him, whine, glare at him? Boy, I'm telling you, the first method works so much better. It's kind of like that Mary Poppins song, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So if we can bring that joy and that laughter and that playfulness into that moment instead of being claws out, probably it's gonna work a whole lot better. Some of you have heard me share recently that I'm using the BAM method in my household and it has been amazing. If you're not familiar with this, let me tell you how this works. I, I, I did this at a recent teaching at Squadron of Sisters when we were able to meet. Uh, I was talking about how 
you can almost envision in those moments when you're getting upset with your husband that there's the devil sitting on your shoulder and maybe an angel over here, but the devil is trying to get you to just snarl at him and take him down and tell him what a loser he is. And we just need to go, bam, like get off my shoulder, Satan. I'm not gonna listen to you talking in my ear anymore. So I shared this with my husband and I said, okay, every time that I'm getting a little bit or you're getting a little snarly or I'm getting a little snarly, you know, one of us should just walk over to the other and go, bam. And it was a playful moment and we are doing a lot of bamming at our house, which I don't know if that's good or bad, but it's actually broken through the tension of the moment and we can kind of laugh at ourselves and go, yeah, I was getting a little bit sour in that moment, you know? Bam! I don't know. It's working for us and it keeps the moment kind of playful and light instead of getting all heavy. Now, this is not appropriate for every relationship. If your husband's being abusive, you know, that's a whole different level, but I'm talking about those more minor offenses, those things where you're just kind of annoyed that he just did this dumb thing again, that, you know, you asked him to, you know, to take the laundry out and he forgot to do it again and you're like ah oh. but you know maybe in this moment when it's not like a huge sin we could use the bam method trying to keep it a little bit playful and light in those moments when we want when we want to be resentful and angry with our husbands we need to pause and ask ourselves two questions is this truly a big deal question number one is this truly a big deal like the hill to die on is this truly a big deal and if it is a big deal, what kind of words and facial expression will be most likely to positively influence my husband to change his behavior? Boy, when I ask myself that question, all of a sudden, I realize that what I was about to say or the way I was about to say it with a glare in my face probably is not going to actually be helpful in that moment. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, what kind of words? What kind of facial expression, what kind of body language in this moment are going to positively influence my husband to perhaps change his behavior? Now, I wanna say on a personal level that I know some of you are feeling weary right now, maybe emotionally drained, probably super stressed by the pandemic that we're all dealing with. I mean, maybe you're heartbroken over some things happening, a loss of a job, uh, not being able to pay your mortgage or your rent, and, you're, and so you're just, you're really kind of reeling right now. Maybe you're actually spiritually apathetic. Boy, I, I sense, I don't know this for a fact, ladies, but I sense that the enemy is strategically using this moment to draw many of you away from the Lord instead of what we should be doing, running toward the Lord in this moment and just calling up women and praying together and pressing into prayer. I sense that the enemy is actually pulling some of you away from the Lord, causing you to be spiritually apathetic in this moment. And no wonder you don't have any joy because the joy comes from the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10, listen to what this says in Nehemiah 8.10, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy comes from the Lord. If you're starting to lose your connection with the Lord, you're going to find that joy just ebbing away. So how do we get this joy of the Lord? Let's talk about seven ways that we get this. This is all in the Bible. The Bible reveals seven different ways to get the joy of the Lord. So let's press into that. First, by spending time soaking in the Bible and actually applying God's instructions. Listen to what Psalm 19, 8 says. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Did you see that connection? I mean, it's right there in that verse that the precepts, the instructions, the commands of the Lord are right and they give joy to the heart when you follow them, of course. Wow, are we missing the boat, ladies, sometimes? Because either we don't know the precepts of the Lord because we're not really in the word or we're not obeying him and then we're wondering where our joy is and he's saying right here. You get the joy of the Lord when you're actually in the word and then following his instructions. Whew. Secondly, we get the joy by truly honoring the Lord one day a week, at least one day a week. Isaiah 58, listen to this verse, starting in verse 13. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. Did you hear that? Did you see that connection? It's spelled out so clearly that if you honor the Lord at least one day a week, you will find your joy in the Lord. Third way that we get the joy of the Lord by choosing 
to speak kind, encouraging, respectful, and hopeful words to others. And then joy actually begins blossoming in our hearts. And you're thinking, well, that is counterintuitive. Me speaking kind words to other people, how does that bring me joy? I don't know, it just does. But because listen to this verse, Proverbs 15, 23. A person finds joy in giving an apt reply and how good is a timely word. You find joy when you are kind to others, when you speak kind, encouraging, loving words, gracious words to other people, it gives you joy. Maybe we should be doing some of that. Fourth way, fourth way that we get the joy of the Lord by saturating yourself with godly influences and avoiding ungodly influences. I asked God to explain to me Proverbs 27, 9, because listen to this little teeny verse, Proverbs 27, 9. It says, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart. And I'm thinking, okay, clearly God's saying that this is a way to get joy, perfume and incense. And I'm like, uh, I don't get it, <laughs> right? Like, what does this mean? And as I prayed about this, I felt God gave me this revelation. Are you breathing in foul, contaminated spiritual air or sweet, fragrant, pristine spiritual air? You will expel what you breathe in. Mm. You will expel what you breathe in. So what kind of spiritual air are you breathing in? In other words, do you spend time, way too much time, watching ungodly TV shows or maybe spend way too much time talking or around um, ungodly influences in terms of your friends or whatever? Or do you fill up with God's word and spend time, maybe even on the phone, with people who love the Lord? Even, it is, even if it is just through texts or phone calls right now during the pandemic, but what are you filling up with? Is it sweet, fragrant, godly influences, or is it foul spiritual air? Because if it's foul spiritual air, that is going to be what you also expel. But if you fill up with godly influences and talk with people who love the Lord, it's like breathing in sweet perfume and it will fill your heart with joy. Fifth way that we gain the joy of the Lord, by choosing to trust the Lord, to do, know, to do what He knows is best, and then looking forward with eager anticipation, and, and then you will obtain unbelievable joy that seems impossible and even mysterious to unbelievers. Proverbs 10, 28, the hope of the righteous brings joy. The hope of the righteous brings joy. So this means that we choose. So many of these things are choices. Have you noticed that? We choose to trust the Lord, that He will do what He knows is best. And then we look forward with great hope and anticipation. And as we do so, we have joy because the hope of the righteous brings joy. Number six, way that we get the joy of the Lord, by spending time in worship. Because He draws close to us when we worship and He fills us with joy in His presence. We know from uh, Psalm 22, I believe it is, that he dwells in the praises of his people. And then in Acts 2.28, uh, it says, You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So we learn from Psalm 22 that he, fill, that he will inhabit our praises. That's being super close. We experience his presence when we're worshiping. And then we find out that when we're in his presence, he, he fills us with joy. Do you see the connection there? I was a little rocky on that, but Psalm 22 talks about how he dwells in the, in the uh, praises of his people. So that's his presence. When we're praising him, he dwells in that. We experience his presence. And then in Acts 2.28, it says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. I love that connection, right? So how about worshiping more? Put on, find your favorite worship songs, you know, Waymaker. I, I love Waymaker. I love Forever by Carrie Job. There, there's a bunch of great worship songs. Start just worshiping the Lord. You will feel His presence. And as you feel His presence, joy begins filling your heart. And then lastly, this is huge, obviously. I saved it for last. We find joy by becoming filled with the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 6. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So that begs the question, how do we get filled with the Spirit? 
couple of thoughts here. As believers, we all have the Holy Spirit now dwelling in us, Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But do make sure that sin is not blocking your access to the Holy Spirit. John 14, 23 says, uh, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. So we do need to obey Jesus' teaching to the best of our ability. We're not going to do it perfectly, but God knows our heart. Do you want to obey the Lord? Are you trying to obey the Lord? Are you repenting? As soon as you go off course, you're saying, Oh, Lord, forgive me. Help me to turn from that thing and get back on course with you. And then also refuse to turn to worldly things to get joy and instead grab hold of the joy of God that he's extending to us through the Holy Spirit. There are a lot of false joy givers out there. They don't really work. They're false. They're delusions. But often we run after these things, whether it's food or alcohol or shopping or whatever. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And Jesus tells us that if we truly want to become Spirit-filled, then all we have to do is ask. Luke 11.13 If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So ask the Lord every day to fill you anew with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, in order to be filled with something, you have to actually empty yourself of everything that's in the way. So I like to pray every morning, Lord, empty myself of me, of my selfish desires, of my own brilliant thoughts. Empty me. I just empty myself of those things, Lord, so that I can have, be completely filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about laughter for just a moment. Laughter makes you attractive to your husband and it helps keep your marriage strong. Research actually shows this. As reported in Psychology Today, neuroscientist Dr. Robert Probain studied laughter and he found these results. Laughter plays a big role in attracting the opposite sex. Who knew? His research actually showed that men like women better who laugh heartily in their presence. His research found that the laughter of the female is the critical index of a healthy relationship. Who knew? He also found that like yawning, laughter is contagious. The laughter that you, you know, demonstrate becomes kind of irresistible in the relationship and now, you're, now your husband or your boyfriend is, is starting to laugh as well. So laughter is huge. Can we just try to laugh more easily? There are also numerous studies about the health benefits from laughter. It boosts your immune system. That would be good right about now. It lowers your blood pressure and more. And also, when you share laughter with your spouse or your children, it's really bonding. Have you ever noticed that? That you'll maybe talk later about something that you guys laughed about a year ago, and someone will bring up something similar. You go, oh, remember that? And you guys bust out laughing, and everyone else says, why are you laughing about that? But it's funny to you guys, and it's kind of bonding in that moment. So I want to give you 10 things that can help bring laughter into your marriage and your home. First, be willing to laugh at your own silly mistakes. Stop taking yourself so seriously. This is a hard one for me. For all of my fellow perfectionists out there, it's very hard when you make a mistake, you're like, oh, you're beating yourself up. But how about if we just stop taking ourselves so seriously? Try to almost always have a twinkle in your eye. You'll find yourself smiling and laughing more if you just intend to have a twinkle in your eye. Flirt with your husband like you used to when you were dating. Schedule game nights with your family and game nights with adult friends when we're able to get together again. And, and here's a key, if you're doing a game night, sometimes people are very competitive. I know I am, anybody else? And so I don't like to be the loser, but it's much easier to lose if I'm with a team. So try to find games that are teams. You know, it, it, then it feels um, better if you're losing with a team and, and you don't have people grumpy because they lost. Uh, take a Sunday drive and sing karaoke in the car at the top of your lungs. Check out funny videos together on YouTube. Just be playful with your husband, playful with your kids. It's okay to be goofy sometimes. Uh, look at old yearbooks or annuals or photo albums and laugh at the old hairstyles and fashions and all those things. Um, when we're able to get out and about, go to a comedy show and watch funny movies and TV shows together. We like to watch reruns of Frasier, uh, maybe Last Man Standing. Lots of people find The Office super funny. I never got that. I'm, I know I'm the only one that never found The Office that funny. But anyway, find those shows that are decent, that are funny, and start watching some of those things together. So we've talked about laughter, but let's talk about fun specifically. You know, bringing fun into your marriage and family. 
find at least one fun hobby or recreational activity that you can do together with your husband or maybe even together with your children. Um, it doesn't have to be something that's like super funny, but just something that you can do together. Uh, my husband and I like to take walks together. We like to do a lawn projects, landscaping projects together. So find something that you can do together. But I also wanted to just throw at you and you can just scribble down if an idea pops out to you. I want to give you 25 ideas on fun stuff to do together. Some of these things you can do now. Some of these things you might have to wait till the pandemic is over. Uh, I've done almost all of these things, not every single one of them, but almost all of them. So I'm gonna breeze through them. Cook a meal together. Man, my husband and I have had some great moments during the pandemic stay at home thing. He didn't used to ever cook with me. Now he's cooking with me and we're having fun. And of course, he knows the right way to do everything. And I just let him pretend that he knows the right way. Um, Go-kart racing. Organize a scavenger hunt with some other couples. Enjoy a live theater. Look for a play that's a comedy. Adopt an accent for one evening. Bonjour! Uh, fill up your gas tank, take 50 bucks, and just start driving and see where you end up. Have an adventure where you don't have it pre-planned. Have a marshmallow war with your family. Play Twister. Eat breakfast in bed. In the winter, have a snowball fight. In the summer, have a water gun fight. Ride bikes to a donut shop for breakfast. Don't do that very often, though. Rent a canoe or a pair of kayaks, go paddling. Be a kid to, you know, with, with your husband and with your kids. Go roller skating or ice skating when we can do those things again. Have a picnic on the living room floor for dinner. That would be fun and something you can even do during the quarantine time. Uh, take dance lessons together. Try rafting in the summer or snowshoeing in the winter. Have a pillow fight. When's the last time you just had a simple pillow fight? Go camping. Go to an amusement park, just you and your husband without the kids and just be kids. Go on a hike, sleep in a tent in the living room. You can do that even during this time where we have a stay at home orders. Wouldn't that be fun to just be fun and, and kind of you know adventurous and quirky by throwing up a tent in the living room. Um, when we're back in, in operation here, you could go to real estate open houses and dream together. You could maybe build something together. Uh, grab some other fun couples, do a progressive dinner night, either at each other's homes or at restaurants. I just did this with a bunch of my grandchildren. It was so fun. This was before the shutdown order. But we actually picked a couple of different restaurants and we did, you know, an appetizer at one and a salad at another and a main course at another and dessert at another restaurant and they thought that was just amazing. Uh, just fun things like that. And pick a sport or activity that neither one of you have much experience in and try it together. Maybe it's target shooting, maybe it's ice skating, whatever it is. But have fun. That alone is so bonding in your marriage. 